Item number, SCP-046. Object class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. The land surrounding SCP-046 has been purchased and surrounded by multiple layers of security, including fencing, barricades, and lethal effect traps. Multiple signs marking the area as private property are to be prominently displayed. The area is to be heavily guarded at all times to prevent access by civilians to SCP-046. All personnel working around or within a 50-kilometer radius of SCP-046 are to undergo rigorous medical testing to ensure the absence of any potentially life-threatening illnesses. Additionally, increased mental health examinations are to be administered to ensure that no personnel inclined or potentially inclined towards self-harm or self-destructive tendencies are allowed within the 50-kilometer radius. Any injured personnel are to be evacuated to a hospital outside of the 50-kilometer zone around SCP-046. All vegetation surrounding SCP-046 is to be destroyed, and all animals attempting to access SCP-046 are to be terminated and destroyed before reaching its outer perimeter. Any personnel showing unusual interest either in SCP-046 or in traveling to the region near SCP-046 are to undergo medical examinations as detailed above. Any modification to these containment procedures are to be approved by O5 Command before being added to this containment document. Any personnel attempting to modify this document without appropriate authorization are to be demoted and reassigned. Description SCP-046 is a predatory botanical mass located in southwestern Kentucky. SCP-046 is composed of two parts. SCP-046-1 is a large mass of vegetative matter, composed largely of plants indigenous to the region, including Quercus alba, Ilex aquifolium, and Lanicera sempervirens, though several offshoots composed of other plant species are also present. SCP-046-2 is the land in the immediate vicinity of SCP-046-1, extending to a roughly circular area 20 meters in radius from its base. This area is SCP-046's primary feeding area. SCP-046 is capable of attracting prey within a 50-kilometer radius through hallucinogenic means. All evacuations of personnel should carry them outside of this radius to disable SCP-046's effect. Animals, including humans, suffering from potentially life-threatening physical injuries or diseases, or who are afflicted by psychological disorders that induce self-destructive tendencies, feel a powerful compulsion to come to SCP-046-2 and lie in a prostrate position facing SCP-046-1. Individuals lying in such a position are rapidly attacked by an unusually powerful combination of saprophytic organisms and opportunistic infections including several strains of methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus MRSA, known to induce necrotizing fasciitis, also known as flesh-eating bacteria, a form of fungal spore similar to Stachybotrys chartarum, or black mold, which poisons prey organisms and induces paralysis, and finally, complete consumption by several heretofore unknown species of insect that emerge from the inside of SCP-046-1 during the final stage of feeding. SCP-046 appears to derive nutrition through the complete digestion of affected individuals, particularly larger mammals, such as humans. It is unknown whether SCP-046 is capable of growth. As such, all steps are to be taken to ensure that SCP-046 is deprived of prey until more information is known about its abilities. These efforts are to include terminating individuals prior to their arrival at SCP-046 and disposing of their bodies in a separate location. Addendum 046-A Investigation is ongoing into potential mimetic effects brought about by knowledge of SCP-046 due to anomalous effects demonstrated by certain personnel in response to SCP-046. Access to Document 046-07 is restricted to Level 4 personnel and above. Item Number SCP-046 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures The land surrounding SCP-046 is to be cordoned off, marked as private property, and surrounded by multiple layers of fencing. The area is to be guarded by no less than 10 guards, though minimal armaments are required. 
While knowledge of SCP-046 effects is not to be made widely known, personnel afflicted with life-threatening diseases may be permitted to enter SCP-046-2 after psychological screening for self-destructive tendencies. Likewise, D-Class personnel selected for termination may be effectively exposed to SCP-046-2 to facilitate this process. Due to the lack of threat to Foundation security, individuals not employed by the Foundation may be permitted access to SCP-046, though Foundation needs for access take first priority. Description SCP-046 is composed of two parts. SCP-046-1 is a cylindrical area 5 meters in diameter and 30 meters tall, containing several species of plant matter, including Quericus alba, white oak, Ilex aquifolum, European hollybush, and Lonicera sempervirens, Kentucky honeysuckle, though several offshoots composed of other plant species are also present. No anomalous traits have been detected in the molecular composition of the plants. SCP-046-2 is a clearing of grass extending approximately 20 meters around SCP-046-1. SCP-046's anomalous effects extend principally to animals, including humans, that are threatened by chronic or debilitating illnesses or injuries. SCP-046 is frequently visited by such individuals. Humans of this type report having felt a compulsion to travel to SCP-046's location, often reporting that the location came to them in a dream. Psychological evaluations have consistently shown that such individuals were not previously aware of either the Foundation or SCP-046's specific properties. Individuals feeling this compulsion have all reported having been within a 50-kilometer radius of SCP-046 at the time. This is believed to be the outer range of the object's compulsive range. Individuals who come to SCP-046 consistently describe a dream in which they lie down in the vicinity of SCP-046-1 and rest. Immediately upon entering SCP-046-2, individuals suffering from chronic pain or traumatic mental conditions will describe their symptoms as receding, accompanied by a feeling of calmness, relaxation, and euphoria. Individuals lying down in front of SCP-046-1 will begin to be covered by several vines, similar to runners of Cynodon dactylon plants, also known as Bermuda grass, followed by the apparent sprouting of C. dactylon all over the body. SCP-046 has no compulsive properties, and its effects will only manifest on individuals willing to experience the effects voluntarily. Individuals exposed to SCP-046 will remain communicative until they are no longer visible beneath the grass growing across their bodies. All individuals exposed to SCP-046's effects describe a feeling of peace and serenity, and a happiness that they were able to die pleasantly. SCP-046 appears to fully decompose individuals exposed to its effects within two hours, and may or may not use decomposed tissue as a food source. Addendum 046-1 SCP-046 to be reclassified as Euclid, and primary containment document to be rewritten to demonstrate SCP-046's predatory nature, by order of O5 Command. Any references to voluntary individuals are to be removed. Description to be rewritten to emphasize volatile and lethal nature of SCP-046 and potential threat thereof. Addendum 046-2 there is no evidence whatsoever that SCP-046 is predatory or has any desire to harm any creature unwilling to expose itself to SCP-046's effects. Suggest original containment procedures be reenacted and voluntary access to SCP-046 continued. No individuals are capable of breaching Foundation security once exposed to SCP-046. As such, there is no reason to deny afflicted individuals the opportunity for relief. Likewise, there is no reason to make this entity seem more hostile than it actually is, aside from a desire to portray every object in Foundation custody as dangerous. Some things must be contained simply because they are strange. Dr. Edward Carter, Head Researcher, SCP-046 Addendum 046-3 Dr. Carter, Principal Researcher for SCP-046, is to be removed from his position and reassigned to the SCP-1250 project. 
Addendum 046-1 stands by order of 05 command. Item number, SCP-055, Object Class, Keter. Special Containment Procedures. Object is kept within a 5 meter by 5 meter by 2.5 meter square room, constructed of cement, 50 centimeter thickness, with a Faraday cage surrounding the cement walls. Access is via a heavy containment door, measuring 2 by 2.5 meters, constructed on bearings to ensure door closes and locks automatically, unless held open deliberately. Security guards are not to be posted outside SCP-055's room. It is further advised that all personnel maintaining or studying other SCP objects in the vicinity try to maintain a distance of at least 50 meters from the geometric center of the room, as long as this is reasonably practical. Description SCP-055 is a self-keeping secret, or anti-meme. Information about SCP-055's physical appearance, as well as its nature, behavior, and origins, is self-classifying. To clarify, how Site-19 originally acquired SCP-055 is unknown. When SCP-055 was obtained, and by whom, is unknown. SCP-055's physical appearance is unknown. It is not indescribable or invisible. Individuals are perfectly capable of entering SCP-055's container and observing it, taking mental or written notes, making sketches, taking photographs, and even making audio-video recordings. An extensive log of such observations is on file. However, Information about SCP-055's physical appearance leaks out of a human mind soon after such an observation. Individuals tasked with describing SCP-055 afterwards find their minds wandering and lose interest in the task. Individuals tasked with sketching a copy of a photograph of SCP-055 are unable to remember what the photograph looks like, as are researchers overseeing these tests. Security personnel who have observed SCP-055 via closed-circuit television cameras emerge after a full shift exhausted and effectively amnesiac about the events of the previous hours. Who authorized the construction of SCP-055's containment room? Why it was constructed in this way? Or what the purpose of the described containment procedures may be are all unknown. Despite SCP-055's container being easily accessible, all personnel at Site-19 claim no knowledge of SCP-055's existence when challenged. All of these facts are periodically rediscovered, usually by chance readers of this file, causing a great deal of alarm. This state of concern lasts minutes at most, before the matter is simply forgotten about. A great deal of scientific data has been recorded from SCP-055, but cannot be studied. At least one attempt has been made to destroy SCP-055, or possibly move it from containment at Site-19 to another site, meeting failure for reasons unknown. SCP-055 may present a major physical threat, and indeed may have killed many hundreds of personnel, and we would not know it. Certainly it presents a gigantic mimetic mental threat, hence its Keter classification. Document 055-1 An Analysis of SCP-055 the author puts forward the hypothesis that SCP-055 was never formally acquired by and is in fact an autonomous or remotely controlled agent, inserted at Site-19 by an unidentified third party, for one or all of the following purposes. To silently observe or interfere with activities at Site-19. To silently observe or interfere with activities at other SCP locations. To silently observe or interfere with activities of humanity, worldwide to silently observe or interfere with other SCP objects, to silently observe or interfere with No action to counter any of these potential threats is suggested, or indeed theoretically possible. Addendum A Hey, if this thing really is an anti-meme, why doesn't the fact that it's an anti-meme get wiped? We must be wrong about that somehow. Wait a minute, what if we were to keep notes about what it isn't? Would we remember those? Bartholomew Hughes, NSA. Document 055-2. Report of Dr. John Marichek. Survey Team Number 19-055-127-BXE was successfully able to enter SCP-055's container and ascertain the appearance and, to some degree, 
the nature of the object. Notes were taken according to the project methodology, after which the container was sealed again. Excerpt from a transcript of personnel debriefing follows. Dr. Hughes. Okay, I'm going to need to ask you some questions about number 55 now. Interviewee. Number what? Dr. Hughes. SCP Object 55, the object you just examined. Interviewee. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't think we have a 55. Dr. Hughes. Okay then. I'd like you to tell me what you've been doing for the past two hours. Interviewee. What? I... Subject appears uncomfortable. I don't know. Dr. Hughes. Okay then. Do you remember that we all agreed that it wasn't spherical? Interviewee. That what wasn't? Oh, right. It isn't round at all. Object 55 isn't round. Dr. Hughes. So you remember it now? Interviewee. Well, no. I mean, I don't know what it is, but I know there is one. It's something you can't remember, and it's not a sphere. Dr. Hughes. Wait a minute. What's not a sphere? Interviewee. Object 55. Dr. Hughes. Object what? Interviewee. Doc, do you remember agreeing that something wasn't shaped like a sphere? Dr. Hughes. Oh, right. It appears to be possible to remember what SCP-055 is not, negations of fact, and to repeatedly deduce its existence from these memories. Personnel involved in Survey 19-055-127BXE reported moderate levels of disorientation and psychological trauma associated with cycles of repeated memory and forgetfulness of SCP-055. However, no long-term behavioral or health problems were observed and psych assessments of survey personnel showed consistent reports of this distress fading over time. Recommendations It may be worthwhile to post at least one staff member capable of remembering the existence of SCP-055 to each critical site. Item Number SCP-074 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-074 is contained at Site-81. SCP-074 is an active info hazard. No research in evaluating its anomalous properties is to be conducted. All personnel who have previously engaged in research into SCP-074's anomalous properties must never come within 5 kilometers of SCP-074. SCP-074 is contained within a 6 meter by 6 meter by 3 meter reinforced glass chamber, filtered to block all ultraviolet light and situated within a windowless room, lit by monochromatic safe lights, which serve as secondary containment. A smaller containment chamber would significantly increase the probability of SCP-074 spontaneously breaching primary containment. The containment chamber is to be surrounded with scaffolds bearing sheets of live cultured human skin, held parallel to the surfaces of the containment chamber, and arranged overlapping each other such that lateral coverage is at least 95%. Skin sheets must be a minimum of 3 mm thick and warm to 37 degrees Celsius and must be grown from samples provided by D-Class personnel with no less than a middle school education and no more than a high school education. All skin sheets are to be examined on a daily basis for instances of SCP-074-1. All instances of SCP-074-1 are to be excised and incinerated. SCP-074 is to be fed 75 grams of fresh shredded apple leaves genus malice, bark, and fruit, hydroponically grown to ensure lack of pollutants and foreign organisms, once a day, via a mechanical dispenser. In the event of a spontaneous containment breach, personnel can coerce SCP-074 into returning to its containment by first occupying each of its four sets of jaws with an entire raw apple, then physically pushing SCP-074 in the desired direction, gently tapping its compound eyes with an open palm or spraying its front pair of antenna with a 0.5% solution of methanoic acid. Description SCP-074 is an anomalous organism which uses various quantum properties at a macroscopic scale and in other ways modifies the standard laws of physics within its immediate vicinity. The specific nature of these modifications appears to be linked to the extent to which humans in SCP-074's vicinity are aware of the precise details of the physical laws which SCP-074 modifies, 
such that research to determine whether SCP-074 has a given property or capability results in SCP-074 developing or manifesting that property or capability. Archive 074-317-E, a full list of the anomalous physical phenomena known to be or to have been associated with SCP-074, is available to personnel level 3 or higher. Personnel who access this document will be disqualified from working with SCP-074 or for any other reason coming within 5 kilometers of Site-81. SCP-074 has repeatedly manifested the ability to spontaneously materialize at locations as much as 3 meters outside its primary containment. This is believed to be, or to be analogous to, quantum tunneling. Foundation entomologists have tentatively identified SCP-074 as belonging to the order Isopoda, commonly known as a woodlouse. Its inertial mass is approximately 1,700 kilograms, but its gravitational mass is approximately 375 grams. Its volume has been estimated at 1.7 cubic meters, approximately the size of a compact car. SCP-074 is female, although it lacks the typical isopod marsupium, or brood pouch in which eggs are incubated, and parthenogenetic. Periodically, Approximately 1.3 times per hour when SCP-074 is shielded from ultraviolet light, and approximately 29.2 times per hour when SCP-074 is exposed to unfiltered daylight, the globular organ at the tip of its ovipositor luminesces and emits what was originally thought to be a form of non-ionizing radiation, but which has since been identified as coherent wave packets of the probability of one of SCP-074's self-fertilized eggs henceforth SCP-074-1, reifying, i.e. becoming a thing, spontaneously coming into existence. Personnel who properly understand the concept of wave packets are disqualified from working with SCP-074. Instances of SCP-074-1 preferentially reify and incubate within the flesh of humans with knowledge of physics. The rudimentary knowledge of physics which even poorly educated adult citizens of a technological civilization can acquire via cultural osmosis. For example, magnets can attract or repel each other, matter is made of atoms, light has a speed, appears to be sufficient. In the absence of suitable humans to serve as hosts, the wave packets will reify within other organisms or within inanimate objects. However, rather than incubating, the eggs will wither and die leaving perforations similar to radiation damage at a macroscopic scale. The wave packets appear to decay over time, as no wave packets or instances of wave packet-related damage have been detected at distances greater than approximately 400 meters from SCP-074. The rate at which successfully incubated instances of SCP-074-1 mature appears to be dependent on the host's exposure to ultraviolet light. Within a host exposed to an average of 30 minutes of unfiltered sunlight per day for a month, an instance of SCP-074-1 was observed to grow from 2 mg to 8 kg, at which point it was surgically excised and killed. Whereas, within a host totally isolated from natural light for a month, the three simultaneous instances reached sizes at excision of only 600 g, 680 g, and 710 g. The complete developmental history and life cycle of SCP-074-1, including how they emerge from their host, and their size at emergence, is not yet known. Item Number SCP-139 Containment Class Epark Disruption Class Dark Special Containment Procedures Containment Suspended Description SCP-139 designates the disappearance of Lucian Sachs, formerly a Foundation-employed security specialist. Sachs had, until SCP-139's occurrence, acted as a consultant for Site-97 on the matter of esoteric reanimation methodology. SCP-139 is considered anomalous, both due to a persistent info hazard encountered following its occurrence and due to the cutoff of information pertaining to SCP-139 after April 4, 1978. Despite Site-97's best efforts, neither Sachs's past or present whereabouts, nor the location of a cadaver, have been uncovered. Extra-dimensional travel is suspected, but not confirmed. No primary suspects which could be responsible for SCP-139 have been identified, owing to the largely inconclusive results of investigative efforts. As such, 
SCP-139 is currently considered a cold case and is expected to continue indefinitely. Timeline of Events March 5, 1978 Sax clocks in at Site-97 and declines usual chatter with personnel at the front entrance. He enters his office and does not exit for the remainder of the workday. For a period of 12 hours, Sax queries 42 skipnet entries pertaining to thaumaturgic workings, global leyline activity, and available research into way and knock techniques. This idle activity contradicts his otherwise exemplary productivity record and raises concern among Site-97 staff. Sensor agents are dispatched appropriately. No further abnormalities occur until Sachs has punched out and arrived at his residence in suburban Albany. By 10.45 p.m., he vacates his residence, presumably on foot to avoid detection, and exits the city limits. March 6th. A paper trail of bus and train tickets suggests he traveled approximately 2,000 kilometers to Topeka, Kansas, arriving at 12.15 p.m. Of note, interviewed civilians occasionally described Sachs as that damn traitor when recounting this 18-hour period. March 7th to April 4th. After Topeka, the paper trail terminates, and reports of Sachs' location during the following month become increasingly irregular. A car he is believed to have rented is sighted in Salt Lake City, Utah, and Lubbock, Texas, on March 10th and March 15th, respectively, although the windshield and rightmost taillight shattered between the two cities. He is last documented in Tucson, Arizona, after residential police implicate him in a resistant flea incident on suspicions of vagrancy. Note, this police report was filed on April 3rd at 3.48 a.m., and is considered the last documented sighting of Lucien Sachs by the public. On April 4th, sensor agents embedded within the Tucson USPS removed the following letter from the mail pool. To the ones I'm running from, I hate you. I hate what you've done and what you're doing to me and what I think you did to the others who ran. I hate how I'd find lenses in the eyes of paintings and strange fingerprints on my belongings. I'm curious by trade, but you've really got me beat. I'm not the first to run, but I might be the first to break free. I'm going someplace without cameras or fingerprints, someplace you can't follow. It was fun while it lasted, but you lost this one. And soon I'll be back, and you're going to lose more. The hand has always been welcoming to people like me anyways. Addendum 139-1 SCP-137 officially concluded on April 27th, 1993 when a minor structural failure revealed a small air pocket within Site-97's concrete foundation. Although this led to a temporary lockdown due to the destruction of Site-97's courtyard, integrity was eventually restored. Models of the air pocket prior to the structural failure indicate it resembled a prostrate human body, fitting Lucien Sachs's height and build. After the initial excavation, the following personal effects were discovered. The necrotic flesh of a heavily decayed human cadaver, and several human bones, most pulverized by the aforementioned structural failure. A foundation keycard for a Site-97 security specialist. ID number scratched out, suggesting deep shame. A forbidden thaumaturgic ritual to preserve its user's spirit after their death. A map of ley line positionings in the contiguous United States, often referenced by enemies of the foundation. A circle had been drawn around a nexus on the U.S.-Mexico border near Tucson, Arizona. Sachs's cause of death is believed to be terminal dehydration, following several days of entombment. During the investigation of this air pocket, Site-97 excavators punctured a secondary cutout hidden within the concrete. Due to the considerable strain that excavation would put on Site-97's foundation, this cutout has not been analyzed extensively. What can be determined, however, is that it contains a large number of partially decomposed human eyes, believed to exceed 1,000 in total. Perforations within the concrete would have allowed these eyes to observe their target on all sides until he expired. Archived Containment Procedures SCP-139 Omega is presently being tracked, observed, and hounded by Site-97 deep cover personnel. Via unanimous O5 vote, the Tucson Ley Line Bridge has been rerouted to Site-97's foundation for the interim. Update. Greater containment effectuated. Protocol. All eyes on Lucian rescinded. Project Lucens in progress. 
Site-97's full capabilities have been directed towards the neutralization of SCP-139 Omega, who remains at large post-mortem via knowledge it has stolen from Site-97. Following a breach of its containment area beneath Site-97, SCP-139 Omega has demonstrated robust mobility and incorporeality, rendering it difficult to track and recontain. Fortunately, it has a habit of sticking its nose in places it does not belong. Note, Ethics Committee review of SCP-139 Omega's containment procedures have generated unanimous approval. Overwatch Command is in agreement. SCP-139 Omega's crimes are many and unforgivable. Site-97 took SCP-139 Omega in. They provided it with safety, community, and purpose. And it has shunned all of those. This is why on the other side of that way, it found nothing but concrete damnation and the all-seeing eye. Item Number SCP-370 Object Class Keter Warning SCP-370 is an exceedingly contagious memetic infection. No cases of personnel being infected simply from reading this article have yet been recorded. But nevertheless, as a precaution, this document may only be read in a controlled environment, with mechanisms in place to terminate the reader at the first symptoms. Spreading any information about SCP-370 by word of mouth is grounds for immediate termination. Special Containment Procedures SCP-370 itself is embedded in a small slab of solid lead and kept inside a solid steel box with no openings and 0.5 meter thick walls. Under no circumstances is SCP-370 to be removed from either this box or the lead slab. If SCP-370 becomes partially or completely exposed, blindfolded personnel will be assigned to locate it with a metal detector. An electromagnet will then be used to transfer SCP-370 to a small mold filled with molten lead. Once this is hardened, the lead slab containing SCP-370 will be returned to its steel box and the box returned to its containment vault. This box is kept in a specially designed vault at site. SCP-370 requires no maintenance whatsoever, and no research is authorized. Desire to open this vault to perform research on SCP-370, or for any other reason, is a symptom of SCP-370 infection. Any personnel displaying this or any other symptoms must be quarantined immediately and terminated if symptoms persist. SCP-370's vulnerability status is unknown. No testing of this sort has been carried out, and no future testing is authorized, due to the extreme risk of contagion to personnel involved. D-Class personnel with significant violent or sadistic tendencies are to be preferred in all interactions with SCP-370, or potentially SCP-370 contagious data. All live broadcasting capability will be removed from any Foundation site that shows signs of SCP-370 presence, and restored one year after the last SCP-370 event. Any personnel assigned to SCP-370 who show a sudden improvement in overall well-being should be quarantined and deprived of sleep. If any personnel continue to display happiness symptoms, despite this measure, termination will be authorized. Description SCP-370 is a key. The size, shape, material, and general appearance of SCP-370 are unknown. Knowledge of these characteristics is the primary vector for the spread of the SCP-370 disease. Therefore, all records thought to contain such information have been destroyed without review. The disease caused by SCP-370 has three distinct sets of symptoms. Designations SCP-370-A, B, and C. The form of the disease appearing in any given subject appears to be determined primarily by personality. SCP-370-A manifests most frequently in subjects characterized by their peers as self-centered or cowardly. It is the most common manifestation. Subjects suffering from SCP-370-A show no symptoms upon the initial infection. However, these subjects will commit suicide as soon as they have an opportunity to do so, with minimal suffering. For example, 
SCP-370-A victims will jump from high ledges or shoot themselves in the head with firearms, but will not cut their own wrists or hang themselves. The instant the subject's heart ceases to beat, the infected corpse will glow brilliantly and undergo an unknown transformation. Detailed knowledge of the transformation is a vector for the infection, as is direct visual contact with the light produced. No trace of any part of a subject's corpse has ever been recovered following this transformation. The majority of SCP-370-B subjects are commonly described as both extroverted and altruistic. However, an identical manifestation of SCP-370-B appears in individuals with strong sadistic or violent tendencies. Subjects infected with SCP-370-B initially become very calm. This stage lasts for several seconds and is followed by a sudden unprovoked assault on anyone within the subject's reach, which continues into an indiscriminate killing spree. Persons killed by the infected subject will glow brightly and undergo an unknown transformation, presumably the same or similar to that of the suicides. Initially, the infected subject is no more dangerous than any ordinary violent human. However, after approximately killing two to three victims, the subject's body will begin to radiate yellow light. This light appears to inhibit the sympathetic nervous response of the subject's victims, making it difficult for victims to fight back. After approximately five to six successful kills, the light triples in intensity, and the direct skin-to-skin -skin contact with the subject becomes deadly. At this point, any eye contact with the victim becomes a contagious factor. After killing an average of 12 victims, subjects who were considered violent prior to infection may require as many as 50 kills to reach this stage. The subject will abruptly cease hostilities and enter the final phase of SCP-370-B infection. Subjects will raise its arms skyward and shout in a slightly amplified voice, Take me home. This sound seems to pass through soundproof walls and industrial strength earmuffs with only slight muffling. Infection of all human beings within earshot is virtually guaranteed, except in case of sensory deafness. After this cry, a shaft of radiation in the visible spectrum forms around the subject, who will then levitate several feet above the ground before and vanishing. As with SCP-370-A, no traces of the vanished subjects have ever been found. SCP-370-C manifests in subjects of high IQ and analytical or contemplative personality type and is the most dangerous of the three manifestations. Unfortunately, the majority of the Foundation's research staff are susceptible to SCP-370-C. Upon initial infection, subjects will close their eyes and remain voluntarily still and silent for an average of 30 seconds. If questioned on this, subjects will claim to have been praying. Any infected subjects detected at this stage must be terminated immediately and by any means necessary. After the initial infection, subjects will behave as normal, but with significant increase in sense of well-being. This system persists even when the subject is forced into unpleasant conditions. Infected subjects seem to possess SCP-370 contagious knowledge about the appearance and exact nature of SCP-370, whether or not they have ever been exposed to such information. Subjects will actively and covertly attempt to spread SCP-370 infection, specifically targeting victims likely to manifest SCP-370-A or SCP-370-C. These efforts are likely to include, but not limited to, mentioning SCP-370 contagious information in casual conversation, attempting to have SCP-370 removed from containment for research or attempted disposal, adding SCP-370 vectors to Foundation research notes or other documents, including this page, attempting to broadcast infectious material on a large scale, after about 50 successful infections, SCP-370-C enters its final phase. During this phase, the air around the subject radiates a small amount of light in the visible spectrum, creating a faint yellow glow around the subject. This glow induces a parasympathetic calming response in viewers, 
and has a percent chance of causing infection for every minute of visual contact. Within about a day of this radiation appearing, regardless of any further successful infections, a flaming data expunged, burn marks on any surfaces it touches or passes through, and leaving no trace of the infected subject. This event leaves behind an invisible patch of contagious space, which infects anyone who passes through it. Patches seem to fade in approximately seven days, but as a precaution, should be avoided for a full two weeks. It has become apparent that SCP-370-C infection is being used by some personnel as an excuse to torment and murder fellow Foundation staff. The personnel responsible have been demoted to D-Class. However, considering the enormous threat posed by SCP-370-C, the containment protocol above will not be revised. Dr. Addendum 370-A The circumstances of SCP-370's original retrieval are unknown. It was found in the ruins of Site a remote foundation base in eastern These containment protocols in their original form and the described steel box were found in a sealed vault along with a single corpse identified as Dr. A known Satanist and the doctor's personal log, which was found to be SCP-370 contagious. The rest of the site was abandoned, and no other dead bodies were found, although signs of struggle were ubiquitous. The rest of the site's stored data on SCP-370 had been erased or destroyed, although a few useful notes on other SCPs were recovered, particularly SCP- Several infection events occurred during recovery efforts. These were contained with extreme prejudice, and the infection was believed extinct. SCP-370 was briefly designated safe. However, in light of recent data expunged, Keter designation has been restored, and anti-memetic security has been tightened throughout all Foundation sites. Addendum 370-B Dr. R's log has been successfully purged of memetic infectiousness, and is cleared for viewing by authorized personnel. The same precautions described for reading this article also apply to the log. Incident 370A Personal Log of Dr. Date Data Absent 2009 Richard's team came back yesterday. What was left of it anyway. Most of them were wiped out by some sort of memetic infection. They've also brought back an artifact. A key or something, from the dig. There's something wrong with Richard. He ought to be inconsolable, having lost so many agents, but he just keeps smiling. Meanwhile, work on SCP has ground to a depressing halt. The next battery of tests will involve irrelevant data expunged. Personal log of Dr. Date Data absent 2009 Ha! I was right. I knew there was something abnormal about those smiles. They brought the artifact out today. Half the people who saw the damn thing just started attacking everyone in sight and had to be put down. The survivors have been quarantined. The bodies of the dead have been incinerated and the survivors are still in quarantine. The artifact recovered has been designated SCP-370. I hate observational memetic hazards, by the way. How am I supposed to study something if I can't f***ing look at it? Personal Log of Dr. Date Data Absent 2009 It's not observational, it's worse. Probably the worst meme we've ever encountered. Reading the notes on the thing seemed to have exactly the same effect as looking at it. It's pure luck I didn't get infected myself. Word of mouth information transfer does the same thing. We've got a full third of our research staff in quarantine now. Or at least we should. Some of them have just disappeared. I'm freaking out here. I did a compassion ritual yesterday. Made me feel a bit better. Details of ritual expunged. Seeing Richard in this state is really messing with my head. He's not himself at all. He's freakishly cheerful, borderline manic, and he's tried to breach the quarantine three times already. Managed to cause several infections by shouting what I assume were details about SCP-370's appearance. 
I don't even know what information can spread this thing. I personally destroyed a bunch of documents without review earlier today, and had anyone who protested quarantined. Dr. C says I'm being paranoid, so I quarantined him too. Personal log of Dr. Date Data absent 2009 Well, I've solved the mystery of the disappearing personnel. Some of the infected commit suicide, and when they do, they vanish with this blinding flash. I caught maybe the very edge of the flash. I'm afraid I'm contaminated now. I can feel the key hovering around the edges of my mind. If I wanted to, I think I could see it in my head. Ugh. I've started a write-up of the containment procedure, for if we ever contain the thing, helps me keep my mind off, well, it. There are three kinds of infections. The murdering kind, the suicidal kind, and the happy kind. Suicides and murderers don't actively try to spread the infection, but deaths caused by 370 all seem to create this infectious light. The happy ones seem mentally unaffected, but their only desire is to spread this thing by any means necessary. They're clever, though. They'll pretend not to be affected. The only giveaway is the happiness. Even if you torture them, they show signs of pain but don't seem to care. It doesn't make them unhappy. On the bright side, I had to have a talk with Dr. C via a Class D go-between, and he told me to go f*** myself, so I've let him go. Personal Log of Dr. Date Data Absent 2009 We've lost our grip on this thing. Richard and team are still contained, but we have the Smilers wandering free in the base. I've taken to carrying a handgun and just shooting anyone who looks happy. Considering how haggard and miserable most of our staff is, there's not much chance of a false positive. I've sabotaged all the communication systems. We will stop this thing here. The infection in me feels like it's spreading, starting to take a conscious effort not to think about that. There is no God. I am God. Personal log of Dr. Date. Data absent. 2009. There is no God. Quarantine had been breached. I'm afraid Dr. C and I may be the only uninfected personnel on site at this point. He's only safe because he was in that quarantine cell for so long. Knowledge is starting to slip. I know things. Expunged. Not know what 370 looks like, but I know expunged. There is no gate. I worship only myself. Personal log of Dr. Date. Data absent. 2009. Notes. From this point on, the writing gets more and more shaky. Some parts appear illegible, and large segments had to be removed due to mimetic contamination. Satan used to be just a symbol to me, a symbol of my own unrepressed desires, a symbol of freedom. I've changed my mind. I pledged expunged. I've performed another ritual, not in the book, just one that came to me. I had to use Dr. C. Felt a bit bad about that at first, but it's all for the foundation. I have a plan. Expunged. Until all the infected have expunged. Should provide an opening for me to make contact expunged. If I can get the physical key encased within the molten lead for my experiment with SCP, then expunged. Until the rest of the foundation finds us. I think I'll stick it in a huge steel box, too. You know, just in case. Personal log of Dr. Date. Data absent. 2009. Notes. This final entry is written in blood and begins with an outline of a complex and gruesome ritual involving, among other things, the use of 80% of the invoker's blood. Intended purpose of this ritual is unknown, and our attempts to recreate it have all failed, with the subjects falling dead from blood loss before completing the procedure. Details of ritual expunged. In the name of adversary I, seal the gates. Expunged. Return to your thrones. Personal log of Dr. Date. Data absent. 2009. Notes. Again, 
written in blood, positively identified as Dr. Ritz. What have I done? My memory is shaky. Not surprising considering what I've been doing to my mind for the past few days. The containment must have been successful, as I find myself sealed in with 370 in this book. Good. The effects of the ritual are beginning to wear off. Feeling extremely woozy. Consciousness fading. What have I done? Ultimate selfishness, or ultimate sacrifice, or just ultimate pettiness and spite. I must apologize to Richard. End of log. Item number. SCP-426. Object Class. Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. I am to be sealed in a chamber, with no windows through which I may be viewed. The door to my chamber must have a label, completely unrelated to my designation or identity, in order to prevent unintended spread of my primary effect. Only level 3 and above personnel are to know of my presence, and particularly of my properties. Assigned personnel are to be rotated out on a monthly basis to prevent contamination by my secondary effect. Psychiatric evaluation is mandatory at the end of the month. If personnel are deemed unaffected, they may be reassigned to me no less than four months after their last rotation with me. Any affected personnel are to be given a Class C amnestic and transferred to a different site. Description Hello, I am SCP-426. I must be introduced this way in order to prevent ambiguity. I am an ordinary toaster, able to toast bread when supplied with electricity. However, when any human being mentions me, they inadvertently refer to me in the first person. Despite all attempts, there is yet to be a way to speak or write about me in the third person. When in my continuous presence for over two months, individuals begin to identify themselves as a toaster. Unless forcibly restrained, these people will ultimately harm themselves in their attempts to emulate my standard functions. I was discovered in the home of the family after the gruesome deaths of three of its members. I had been given to the younger Mr. and Mrs. as a wedding gift. No card or any other identifying markings had been found on my box. Approximately two months after the family received me, fire crews were dispatched to the home due to an electrical fire. The younger Mrs. died from the electric discharge that she had caused when attempting to devour an electric socket. The other two victims had died shortly before the fire occurred. The elder, Mrs. had gorged herself with nearly 10 kilograms of bread before her stomach burst, and she died of internal bleeding. The younger, Mr. died of severe blood loss after attempting with me. The sole survivor was the elder, Mr. who was suffering from severe malnutrition. He stated that he had inserted some bread a week prior and was still waiting for the toast to pop out. I was confiscated by the Foundation after police noted my unusual properties. A Class C amnestic was administered to the affected officers. Experiment Log 426-1 Date Expunged Subject D-Class Personnel D-426-1 Procedure D-426-1 was asked to describe what he believed was contained in my chamber. He was not informed about my identity or properties. Details D-426-1 stated, I'm probably some huge monster holed up in there. That's what you guys have all over the place, right? D-426-1 remained oblivious to his use of the first person pronoun. Experiment Log 426-2 Date Expunged Subject D-Class Personnel D-426-2 Procedure 426-2 was placed in my chamber and given regular meals through a dispenser. No communication with D-426-2 was permitted. Multiple cameras were situated in the chamber, positioned so that I was outside of their field of vision, but allowing constant observation of D-426-2. We remained sealed until my secondary effect manifested in the subject. I was bolted to the floor so that I could not be moved into a camera's view. Details After 45 days of isolation, D-426-2 wrapped his arm around me 
and began conversing with me, stating that we were brothers. D426-2 never deviated from using the first person plural when speaking with me. Subject was terminated one hour after this event. It is theorized that the isolation accelerated the progression of my secondary effect. Experiment Log 426-3 Date Expunged Subject D-Class Personnel D426-3 Procedure A screw was removed from me and shown to D426-3, who was asked to describe it. D426-3 was not informed about my identity or properties. Details D426-3 referred to it as my screw. Consistent with Experiment 426-1, the subject was oblivious of his use of the first person in his description. This suggests that, even if I were destroyed, my effects would still be inherent in my remains. Experiment Log 426-4 Date Expunged Subject D-Class Personnel D-426-4 Procedure D-426-4 was placed in isolation in a cell adjacent to my chamber to be observed until my secondary effect manifests. Details No effects appeared. D-426-4 was terminated 90 days after the start of the experiment. Thank God there are some limits to my effects. A lot of us were really starting to get worried about me. Dr. C. Item Number SCP-436 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-436 must be closed at all times except for testing purposes. It is stored in a large unlocked room to avoid misplacing the item. Personnel below level 3 are not allowed to enter the room. Once per week, SCP-436 will be moved to a nearby identical chamber to allow the floor to be reconstructed. Description SCP-436 is a small locket, apparently made from gold. When opened, an inlaid photograph can be seen. It is unknown if the photograph is the source of SCP-436's effect, because this cannot be tested. All measurements within a certain distance of SCP-436 will be affected by significant error. There is no observed pattern to the amount of error. It seems to constantly change, though this cannot be verified because it requires a time measurement. This issue is common to many aspects of SCP-436. The range cannot be reliably determined, the intensity of the error effect cannot be verified, and its location is often vague. It is known, however, that the error effect extends towards its own nature. To clarify, a measurement is required to learn anything about the error effect, and this measurement will have an error. The actual dimensions of an object will be permanently affected, even after removal from SCP-436's range. Lids on containers cease to fit properly. Level objects tilt, and measurement devices in particular will warp. Individuals affected by SCP-436 will have their height and weight altered, and in some cases, their personality. Ability to learn, perform calculations, and make judgments will be impaired. Medical conditions, such as data expunged, and in particular cancer, have occurred. Long-term exposure to SCP-436 allows the alterations to accrue, eventually resulting in an often indescribable item. Dr. possesses three samples, currently under study. When SCP-436 is closed, the error effect apparently decreases in intensity, although as previously mentioned, this cannot be confirmed. Attempting to average many measurements affected by SCP-436 will not result in a more accurate measurement. Note that these are not isolated instances of the effect. The measurements simply average to a significant deviation. With multiple averages from multiple sets of trials, the result still does not gain any accuracy. It is unknown how SCP-436 produces this multi-layer effect without- Addendum 
When handling SCP-436, leave it in a flat, open place. We usually have trouble finding it again when personnel leave it in a container, and when we do, it's not easy to open. Doctor... Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.